Welcome back to Palisade Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix, and joining me today is Kevin Muir. He started trading for RBC Dominion Securities as an institutional equity derivatives trader and then spent 20 years trading his own account. He's also the author of the Macro Macro Tourist Newsletter. How are you today, Kevin? Great. Great to be with you today, Tom. Thanks. It's great to have you. So I thought we could start a little bit by how we see this sovereign debt bubble building. It's something that everybody seems to be concerned about, and and you have some very interesting views on MMT, and and we can get into that stuff. But how do you see this uh, playing out over, let's say, the short and and long term? Well, I'm very concerned about the, let's just say, the investing community's infatuation with owning bonds. I think bonds, uh, whereas a lot of the kind of investors are expecting it to be the uh, ballast to a portfolio, I worry that bonds might be the anchor that sinks you in the next uh, readjustment of, of the market. And the reason I think that is because when we look back at the last 20 years of uh, kind of the economy and markets, or even farther than 20 years, maybe even 40 years, we've been in an environment where all of the money creation has basically fallen at the uh, feet of the Fed meaning that the kind of the uh, authorities, whenever there was a problem, whenever there was a hiccup in the economy, it was met with more and more monetary stimulus. And unfortunately, that meant that we piled more and more debt, and it ended up being that we got into a situation where it was more and more difficult for the economy to be stimulated by lower rates until eventually we hit a point in 2008 where we hit negative rates. Uh, not negative rates in the U.S., but negative rates you know, throughout the world. And at the very least, we hit zero rates in the U.S. And at that point, we, the economy had, was no longer able to be stimulated through monetary means. And we entered into a very uh, kind of scary situation because it meant that we would have to do quantitative easing and all sorts of extreme monetary stimulus. And in doing that, we've kind of gone down this road that I think will eventually mean that the monetary policy becomes completely ineffective. And now we're in a situation where the only way we can deal with it is actually by doing fiscal stimulus. So uh, when in doing some research for, for the interview, maybe you could explain to us the difference between how you define fiscal and the other types of stimulus that we're looking at here. Okay, so if we think about kind of for the 2020 corona crisis, and we think back to all the other times that we saw the economy, a recession hit us. Well, let's just start with uh, maybe the 2000 bubble. The 2000 bubble burst, and what did Greenspan do? He lowered rates. There was no change in the government policies in terms of what they would spend. It was all done through monetary kind of adjustments. And then what happened was in the 2008 situation, we actually had a situation where the economy collapsed and they lowered rates, but it was ineffective. because they lowered rates to zero and then at zero, there was nowhere more to go. So they had to do quantitative easing. And unfortunately with quantitative easing, it wasn't as uh, stimulative as for kind of the real economy as the textbooks would have said. And part of the reason that it wasn't as stimulative for the real economy was that at the same time that the monetary authorities, meaning the Fed and other central banks, were loosening rates, we had a situation where governments were actually cutting back on spending. And this is this is somewhat controversial, but everyone seems to remember Obama is this spendthrift president that blew up the size of the deficit or the debt, and they think about him as uh, creating all this or doing all the spending. But if you look at the kind of the discretionary federal budget over the last 40 years, meaning like the part of the, the budget where the government can actually choose how much they spend, if you look at that over the last 40 years and you take a year over year change, and you examine those year-over-year changes. Up until the great financial crisis, there was three years that actually saw a decline. Meaning every other year, 
the government spent more. And I'm talking about in real terms, like adjusted after inflation. So the three years were 64, 68, and then there was a year with the Clinton in the 90s. I think it was 96. And so all the other periods, you had the government continually spending more and more. Then the great financial crisis hit. The, uh, Bernanke took rates down to zero. He then had to do quantitative easing. And we had a private sector credit destruction occurring. Well, at the same time that this is occurring, we have the government going in also spending less money. Yes, for a little tiny bit, they spent more with the cash for clunkers and with all those things. But on the whole, for the next five years, for 2008, 9, 10, and 11, 12, the, the government actually spent less each and every year. So what this meant was that more and more of it relied on the, the kind of monetary stimulus. So this is why Bernanke had to do QE1, QE2, QE3, and like in the Operation Twist and all of this stuff because he was forced to kind of be the only part that was stimulating of the government because the other part of the government was doing pro-cyclical cuts at the absolute worst time. Now, fast forward to 2020 with the corona crisis. This is not being the case. Powell has learned his lesson, and he's realized that there's only so much he can do, and he's encouraged the government to go and to do lots of fiscal stimulus. And that is what is dramatically different in this crisis versus every other crisis that we've had, in that the government, instead of going and actually reining in during a recession, is actually providing a huge amount of stimulus, meaning they're spending or giving back to the public. And so that has been why the market has been so surprised that the stock market has not gone down, that we haven't had the collapse in the economy that everyone expected, because the government has offset a lot of that kind of credit destruction by, in essence, printing the money that was needed. Absolutely. And as a lot of us that have done, let's say, cursory research on trying to understand the fundamentals on this this market and, and why it hasn't gone down and, and why the, the bad things that we've seen, especially as gold bugs, haven't happened. There's an interesting post that you've written, and, and you've titled it one of the most interesting posts you could write this year. In it, you're talking about how Trump is one of the most MMT presidents that we've ever had. Could you explain to us a little bit about why you're open-minded to MMT and how it's actually theoretically working right now? Okay, so let's let's step back and think about what MMT means. And, and I know a lot of people have some terrible, terrible feelings when they hear MMT. Their blood starts to you know curl, and they and they get all upset, and they get irate, and they think to themselves. There's, uh, there's this just is spending at infinity and they think it's like the Weimar Republic. And the other thing they always tell me is they say that it's uh, this is just like Japan. It didn't work in Japan. Why do we expect it to work here? To be fair, Kevin, just to interrupt you yeah. for a second, going into reading that article, those were my exact thoughts. And I was very surprised and uh, I found it very interesting to to hear your thoughts on that. Okay, so let's talk first about why Japan is not uh, an example of what uh, MMT is all about. Japan went and, and basically did extreme monetarism. And what do I mean by that? They just tried to do more and more monetary stimulus, at which point people are going to say, well, no, no, they did the bridges to nowhere every single time they, uh, you know, they, were, they were trying to spend, print and spend. And I say, no, but the difference that Japan has is that they go, every time their economy started to get going, they were obsessed with balancing the budget. So the moment it uptick, they would go and they would actually raise taxes. Now, I say that Trump, even before the corona crisis, was the most MMT president we've ever had. And the reason I think that is because if you examine what MMTers believe, and I'll just kind of give you a synopsis. They think that there is no financial constraint on the government spending. There is only a real constraint, meaning inflation is the only real thing stopping the government from spending. If you kind of think about that and then think about what Trump did, 
he was eight years into an economic kind of expansion, everyone would have, at that point, the Keynesians would be telling you that they should be paying back the debt. The Austrian guys would just be upset that rates aren't cranked. Everyone would be telling you that the last thing you should be doing is expanding the, the government kind of fiscal lever, right? Yet at that point, what did Trump do? He went and actually did a tax cut. And then after the tax cut, they said, well, why are you pushing for lower interest rates if the economy is so good? At which point he said, but there's no inflation, which is, again, what an mmt -er would say. Now, the MMT people would hate to hear that Trump is actually doing their policy because they, they, they generally buy, you know, um, they kind of do it. Now, the thing about MMT, the, the whole point about that everyone thinks it's this left-wing policy. And I went, and I'll, I'll tell you how kind of my MMT uh, awakening happened. I was uh, writing my newsletter, and someone asked me what I thought about it. And I thought to myself, well, I don't know what it stands for. You know, I don't know what it means apart from the modern monetary theory. So I better go learn about it. So I asked my buddy, uh, you know, he was actually George uh, Perks from, uh, from Bespoke Investments. I said, can you, can you point me in the right direction? So he points me in the right direction. He points me to Stephanie Kelton and gives me a couple of speeches to watch. And I, and I listen to her and I think to myself, that makes no sense. That's just, that's just crazy talk. Like that doesn't, that's just the stuff she was saying was just, it wasn't computing in my brain. Like I went to economic school, you know, for, for university and it just, all the things that she said seemed almost backwards. Like she started talking about the fact that the government borrows, sorry, spends and then borrows the funds. And she would tell, say things like the government that need to borrow those funds is actually self-imposed. And I'm thinking like, no, that, that just can't be like, that's not how, how it works. You can't do it. But then as I started to learn more and more about it, I became more and more kind of interested in it. And I started to open my mind about it. Now, one of the things that has happened with MMT is it's being kind of grabbed by the left wing of kind of the political left wing, because there is no doubt that the MMT believes that there's a lot more fiscal room to spend, meaning governments can spend. But they're actually, if you look at who kind of came up with MMT, one of the founding kind of thought leaders on it was a fellow by the name of Warren Mosler. Warren Mosler was a hedge fund manager, and he's actually, he traded the kind of plumbing of the, uh, of the short-term interest rate market. And he kind of understood how all of these things work together. And he put it all together. And then, so he came up with his policy, with this kind of belief about how the economy really works. And one of the things about Warren is he's much more of a, I would say, entrepreneurial, more of a traditional capitalist. And he goes, and when he talks about MMT, he'll say that the government should do fiscal stimulus, but that doesn't mean that they have to spend more. It also could mean that they tax less. So a lot of times when people tell me that they don't like MMT, I say, well, you know, I get it. You don't like the government spending. There's a lot of people who think the government can't do anything right. What about if we just tax less? And so one of the things I'd like to kind of bring your, your kind of mind around, something for you to think about is that let's look at Europe. Europe is going and they are struggling with an economy that just can't seem to get out of its own way. They're just, they're faced with just moribund growth and all they do is continually lower interest rates in the hopes that they can go and stimulate some spending. Now, if somebody is kind of, if there's no money to be had, if somebody tells you that they're going to go and they're going to cut your loan down from 50 basis points to 25 basis points, is it going to make you borrow anymore? No. Like, let's think about it if you're uh, kind of a, a company that's interested in doing some CapEx expansion, like you're thinking about building a factory. If somebody says that the, the, the kind of the, the, the interest rate on that loan is now, instead of it's a negative 40 basis point, it's a negative 50 basis point. That 10 basis points is not going to kind of say, oh, now it's time to go out and make this factory. And in fact, one of the things is, if you think about it, that the reality is that the real problem is not the, the carrying cost of that loan. The real problem is you'll have nobody to sell anything to. Right. And so 
the risk of it being worthless because there's just nobody to sell anything to is the real problem. There's a lack of real demand. Right? And if you look, Goldman Sachs actually did a study where they went and looked at interest rates versus CapEx, meaning like as interest rates fall, the traditional economists will tell you that that should mean that there's more CapEx spending because it's getting cheaper. And in the 80s and 90s, it was definitely that case. As interest rates fell, more people would go out and borrow and spend to make factories and other things like that. In the, in the, in the 2000s and 2010s, it actually flipped, meaning that as interest rates fell, there was less CapEx spending. And the reason that is, is because it was actually reflective of there being less demand in the economy. So if there was less desire, as interest rates fell, there was less desire to go make a factory because chances are it meant that the economy was weaker and there was no one to sell it to. So now let's go back to the idea about, well, let's think about what's going on in Europe. Europe is sitting there and they're desperately going and they're trying to do lower and lower rates. And it doesn't seem to work. They hit zero and then they go negative. I would argue that negative rates actually slow the economy. So not only does it not become stimulative anymore, I think it actually goes the other way and becomes uh, you know, counterproductive as they lower rates into more and more negative, it slows the economy more and more. So I look at the policies that the people that believe in monetarism, this, this constant lowering of interest rates, and I think this is ridiculous. Like this just makes no sense. And what MMT comes and says, well, Instead of going and lowering interest rates, why don't you go and why doesn't the government spend? Or, as Warren Mosler would say, if the government doesn't want to spend, if you don't believe in kind of the, the government doing more, why don't they tax less so that there's more money in people's genes? And so one of the things that everyone should always remember about MMT is the, the kind of the concepts about how it works in terms of those decisions about what you do in terms of whether you spend, whether you tax less, those are political decisions. But the kind of the, the theory behind it in terms of how the economy actually works is the true MMT. So MMT does not mean that they're going to go out and spend and it's going to be socialism. And in fact, it doesn't, you know, in its kind of purest form, it's nothing more than a economic kind of theory about how the economy actually works. So so trying to look at that from a more long-term view, it's it does seem to be working for now. We've we've seen another another high. We've we've gotten back to the highs that we um, demolished in March. So trying to look at it again from a, a more long-term view, wouldn't more spending and and lower rates just create eventually uh, huge hyperinflation? So, yeah, so you're absolutely right. I, I have a funny story to tell you. Because I've been somewhat sympathetic to MMT and I've gone and learned about it and I don't immediately just dismiss it as something that doesn't work in, or that something I don't care about because I don't like the way it sounds, I have actually gotten invited on to do an MMT podcast. And when I went on this MMT podcast, it was kind of funny because they went and they had um, kind of disclaimers at the beginning. And the disclaimers at the beginning were all basically the fact that I am a markets guy. And although I, you know, I, I kind of you kind of give him a chance because he actually, although he doesn't, he likes markets, he also is sympathetic to MMT, right? And so they had like literally five minutes of disclaimers about how much I was like a markets guy and I wasn't pure MMT. And so this is where I differ from the MMT folks greatly because they think that they're going to actually create a, um, they're going to be able to control the inflation. So they think that they're going to be able to stop it and they're going to be able to tax more. And they have all these wonderful theories about why they're going to be able to not uh, kind of the inflation is not going to get away from them. I believe that just like monetarism was, um, let's just say taken to the extremes, MMT is going to take it, be taken to extremes as well. So yes, I do think that eventually it's going to create inflation and that inflation will be more than everyone thinks. But I probably disagree compared to most people in that they would argue that that inflation is going to be hyperinflation and there's going to be no way to control it. I think that what we're experiencing right now 
Um, why haven't we experienced the, the hyperinflation already? We've just you know, printed, you know, $3 trillion and it doesn't seem to cause the hyperinflation. What about Japan? Why hasn't Japan experienced the hyperinflation that all these people, you know, have been talking about? Right. There's all sorts of questions like that that I kind of I, I think that eventually it will create it. It just won't create it as quickly as everybody thinks it will. Or sorry, as everybody as the, the detractors think it will. It will work well at first. And then then that's when the problem will occur because it'll work. It'll seem like it's a free lunch and then it, it will be abused just like every other economic policy is abused. So can you explain one of your thoughts in a, in a letter you wrote is that there 1.5 trillion of that stimulus has been borrowed but not actually spent yet? Okay, yeah, sure. We can talk about that. That's, so there's something called the Treasury General Account. And uh, this is actually kind of a fascinating uh, – it, it's a little bit in the weeds because it's a, it's a very arcane kind of uh, detailed topic. But it used to be that the Federal Reserve um, – and the, and the Treasury, the Treasury, when they wanted to spend, they would just uh, go in and spend and they wouldn't actually have a checking account that they could run up and down. So they, they would take money in and then they would spend it and they would figure it out like that. But for a whole host of technical reasons, they actually changed it so that basically at, at towards the end of Obama's term, the government got given or they started using this thing called the Treasury General Account, which is basically a checking account that they can run up, meaning that they can go and issue T-bills and have a balance in. So, for example, when Obama got into some trouble and he thought that there wasn't going to be a budget passed, the Treasury went, in, went out and they actually issued a whole bunch of T-bills ahead of time. And so the reason they did that was so that they had the money in their accounts in case the government shut down. So that they could actually go sell it. I mean, sorry, they sold the T-bill so that they could actually go spend it while while the government was shut down. So they ran up the Treasury General account. Okay, but if you think about that, what's happening there is that the Treasury is going out, sucking liquidity out of the system because they're issuing the T-bill, but they're not spending it because it's just sitting there inert on the Fed's balance sheet. And it's not getting spent. It's not getting put out back into the economy. So then what happens is there's no, um, there's no uh, kind of budget problem. And Trump wins the election. And Trump kind of runs the Treasury general account back down. And what that did was, if you remember, we had a wild a kind of stock market rally when Trump first kind of came that whole first year. I really think that the part of that reason was that the Treasury general account was getting put kind of spent down and it had gone from, I can't remember, 200 billion back down to zero. Then the next year, there's some problems again. And what do they do? They go and they get worried about the budget issue because Trump is against, once again, fighting and with the kind of Congress and there's some worries that they might not be able to pass it. And so they run the tre Treasury General account up. Again, what happens is the stock market kind of stumbles and it's not as good a year. Then it happens again. He goes and he runs it back down once it all kind of gets sorted out. And next thing you know, the stock market takes off. And I, you can go through it and you can see it on this chart. Now, obviously, there's a lot more going on than just the gen Treasury general account. But there's no doubt in my mind that it's affecting kind of the timing of how the economy works. Because, you know, the government is running up and down these numbers. What's happened now in the wake of the corona crisis is that the Treasury general account has gone and previously the highs were something like 400 billion the treasury general account is now 1.5 trillion dollars so what does that mean that means that the government has borrowed 1.5 trillion dollars that is yet to be spent and sent out into the economy and i i can't figure out if mnuchin is like a uh, kind of Machiavellian genius, or if he's just a bumbling idiot that kind of didn't realize that he had to get the money out. But by kind of running it up ahead of time, what he did was he forced Powell to do more QE because there was this withdrawal of liquidity that they had to offset. And now he has the ability to run that back down. 
they're for those that are kind of more, you know, ne- like thinking that he's nefarious and that this is all big plot, you know, the tinfoil hat crowd, they would argue that he's doing it on purpose so that he can release this liquidity at an optimal time going into the election. Other people will say, no, it's just the government. It's tough for them to spend that much. There's a lot of issues with getting that kind of money out into the system. We've never done it before. The bureaucracy. All right. I, it doesn't really matter because what I'm saying is that everyone thinks that we've gone and spent three trillion dollars for the actual into the economy. And I say that we still have only spent half of it. And in fact, I saw today that uh, this uh, gang of uh, kind of conservative uh, kind of Tea Party guys got together and said something to that effect in terms of they issued a letter to both Trump and the, the leaders of the, of the houses saying, stop spending. You haven't even spent the stuff that we've given you. And they are technically correct on that part. And I guess people say, well, what do you make of that? And I say, well, I, I don't know the timing of when it's going to be released into the economy. So I'm not sure in terms of when it's going to happen, but I do know that it is going to happen. And this is part of the reason that I would be kind of worried about getting too bearish for a longer term point of view, because I think that a lot of the stimulus is still coming out. Like it's still, we still haven't felt the full effects of what the the government has spent. Taking these uh, somewhat esoteric ideas into account. Let's talk about something that seems to be a bit more tangible and and try and understand how, from your eyes, this affects our investing landscape going forward. What does this mean for gold and, and maybe some other ideas on, on how to hedge against this? Okay, so the true MMT guy, folks, they're going to tell you there's no reason to own gold. Uh, it's, it doesn't, it's a non-productive asset. There's going to be no inflation. We're going to be able to control it. Everything's great. I call BS on that. I think that they're going to abuse it. I think that once people start to understand how um, easy it is for the people to spend, because don't forget, up until now, we've always been believed that we were financially constrained. Governments couldn't spend because, there, you know, before this, there was always a belief that, oh, we're going to leave this debt to our grandchildren. We can't do this. So this was, it was kind of a a limiting factor. And since the Corona crisis has come, this kind of uh, taboo has been shattered. And now we kind of no longer have this worry about this. And so it's basically going to encourage governments to spend. And so I, I, I do believe that the governments are going to spend And I think eventually they're going to spend to a point where they actually start crowding out private investment and they will cause inflation. And this will be tantamount to the shift that occurred in 1981 when inflation was turned, you know, on its head with Volcker raising rates. And we had 40 years of kind of disinflation. I believe that we are almost in the anti Volcker moment where after 40 years of inflation just going lower and lower and lower, we're going to have inflation going higher and higher and higher. So now, what does that mean for your portfolio? Obviously, one of the ways that you can protect against inflation is through gold. And gold is great in that not only does it protect you against inflation, it really truly is actually correlated with with real rates, meaning the rate after inflation, right? So, one of the things that um, people forget is that one of the best times for gold was what in the in the two thousands and in the two thousands we didn't have a lot of inflation but what we did have was inflate we had real I mean, interest rates below the the rate of inflation and if we think about what's going to happen here and the fact that there's more and more debt and that we're actually going to create inflation I believe that governments will leave interest rates pegged low in real terms, meaning that it'll be below the rate of inflation. And that is actually what they're trying to accomplish. So in that environment, gold and silver will do terrific. I think that it'll be uh, like a terrific, it's going to be an awesome investment. And one of the things that I like to talk about with gold is actually a Grant Williams presentation where he talked about how small the gold market is in terms of in the grand big pictures of, of kind of investment landscape. 
and I can't remember the exact number, but I think it's like he said something like there's a 0.15% of pension assets are in gold. It was some, it was some ridiculously no, low, low number like that in gold related assets. And he argued that if that got doubled, so pension plans went from 0.15 to 0.30, and what would that mean for the gold market? And it was like he, it was like something like you could buy all the GLD and all the GDX, and it was like it was almost like the whole market cap of all the gold and like that was out there trading. And the point is that in the grand scheme of the of kind of the world, pension plans, um, gold is almost too small for them. And that's why one of the reasons that they've ignored it. So, but if they go and they decide that they're going to go and start buying some gold, it wouldn't take much for them to actually send it doubling, tripling in a heartbeat because it's such a small market. It's tiny. It's, and, and it w- really, truly wouldn't take much for them to come in and just send this thing to absolutely unbelievable levels. And one of the things that I believe is if you're thinking about a pension plan and you're trying to think about hedging kind of the risks that you see going forward, well, I would argue that given the corona crisis and given how quickly kind of things have spiked back up and given that that, that uh, the Fed is now buying all the corporate bonds, a lot of your traditional hedges, meaning buying VIX or buying CDS protection, are, are kind of getting backstopped by the Fed. So those, those kind of insurance policies don't seem as kind of attractive to me if you're a long-term kind of pension plan administrator. And when I think about if I was running a big pension plan, what I would be worried about, and I think to myself, well, I would be worried about inflation. I would be worried about what to own. It seems to me it'd be very easy to go, this is our new insurance policy, which is gold. So I'm a huge gold, you know, bug. Like I, I just... It's uh, kind of, I kind of laugh, you know, a little part of me is still like that JP Morgan, uh, you know, uh, what is it? What is this line? Gold is money. Everything else is credit. Um, there, even though uh, I, I, I'm sympathetic to all these other kind of newer policies, I truly believe that that is kind of gold has been with us for thousands and thousands of years and will be around for thousands of years going forward. So that's one thing. I love the, those things. The next thing I believe is that I go and I look at inflation and I think about those pension plans again. I think, what can you own if you're those guys? And one of the things that I truly believe that they're going to be the worst investment out there for them will be bonds. I am the biggest bond bear over the long run. I think that you're either going to get crushed kind of in um, with the prices going down or you're going to get crushed in terms of real ter- in, in real terms when you get inflated away. I, I I find it amazing that everyone screams about all the debt outstanding in this in the world, and then they want to buy those bears want to buy the thing that there's so much of. Like like that to me it makes no sense. Like you'll see these fellows the the the, the kind of famous Bintwit bears and they'll get on and they'll start talking about all the debt in the system and then what do they do? They'll tell you that they should go buy long bonds. And I look at long bonds and I think to myself, they're like, it, it's kind of like a, it, it, there's only so low they can go in terms of yield. And you're, you're eventually just playing, you know, uh, you know, the greater fool theory. And it truly is a Ponzi s- uh, scheme. And so I think that bonds are going to be the disaster that nobody's expecting. And so I think about what, what they can own, those pension plans. They have to sell their bonds. And I think they're going to have to buy tips, meaning treasury inflation protected securities. And I look at it and one of my favorite trades out there is actually what's called inflation break even. And that means that I'm long tips and I'm short bonds. And what I'm trying to do is actually own the inflation component of the kind of the market. And what's interesting is that you would think with all this printing and all this kind of fiscal stimulus and for all the reasons that everyone's worried about, you think that inflation and kind of expectations would be going through the roof, and they're not. You go look at 30-year inflation expectations, they're well below 2%, meaning that the market doesn't even think that the Federal Reserve is going to be able to achieve their inflation uh, target, which I think it's just, which is just crazy. But this has been the whole problem is that 
people have kind of been slow to realize that the Fed and the government, if they really truly want to, can create money and can spend it out of thin air, and eventually they are going to create inflation. And, and you know, there's like some very famous um, bears out there that the, the talk about the, the looming U.S. dollar shortage, or they'll talk about the coming deflationary collapse. And all of those concepts are based upon the idea that the government is unable to create money. And, and I, this is what I say to them. I always say, if everyone believes you're correct, then you, you could actually, it could be self kind of fulfilling. Meaning that if, if no one believes the government can go and create inflation and aren't willing to go do it, then yes, you will be correct in that they will all deflate in on itself. However, there is nothing stopping us from going and creating inflation. And I think that this corona crisis has actually woken the public up in terms of how easy it is to go and do this. It's almost too easy. And this is what I think will eventually happen is that they will abuse it. But in the meantime, uh, kind of I always laugh and say people talk about uh, the, the fact that we're going to kind of collapse from deflation. And I asked them to name a country that's ever collapsed due to deflation, and uh, they don't seem to be able to tell me any. But then I asked them to give, kind of name me countries that have collapsed because of inflation, and there sure are lots of them. So I, I, if we have the political will, there, we can always create inflation. And it's just been a question of whether we've had the political will and kind of the understanding about how to go and create that inflation. And, and I would argue that now that Corona has kind of shown us the way, it's going to be a little too easy. And so, therefore, I want to own everything inflation kind of based. One one other interesting trade idea that um, I was reading about from you, uh, you originally made the call on June 3rd and, and updated it on June 8th, and it was shorting the S&P. Uh, last Thursday, we saw a 7% drop on that one day. So can you tell us a bit more about that trade? And, and once you were able to execute on that, did you close it? Or, or how, how do you go about thinking about that particular trade? So, yeah. So one of the things about me with my letter is I do mix time frames. So, so far, I've been talking about my longer term view that both the stock market will go higher, inflation will go higher. But, you know, I, 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 I grew up and cut my eye teeth on a, on a trading desk and I'll always be a trader. So there are periods where I'll go against that and I'll, I will have kind of tactical trading views. That was um, on the day, um, if you remember, that the Federal Reserve came out and, and Jer uh, Jerome Powell came out and it was the most dovish uh, kind of uh, uh, speech or kind of comments that he's ever done. And I have a good friend who's a hedge fund manager, and he said to me, he says, you got to buy everything. This is, this is like he's basically just, he's, you can't get any more dovish. And I thought to myself, I thought, oh, my God, here we are. We're finally there. When it's become so obvious to even the bears that, there's, there's, that the Fed's got your back, it's kind of time to, to go the other way. And I wrote on there that when it finally seems obvious, it's the time to go the other way. And one of the things is that I was bullish kind of, um, I was a little early I, like on, in, in the lows. Like I think I went on to another podcast and I, and I, and I remember, I think it was March. Uh, I, I think it was two or three days below the, before the lows. And I was on this up podcast and I told them, I said, I think the fed is going to print and the government's going to spend, and then you should buy stocks. And I think it was like March 17th or March 20th or something like that. And you should have seen the hate mail that I got. This was this, like people were telling me I was an idiot. I didn't understand how bad the virus was. And it was just everything, everything and everything. It could, I couldn't believe it. I, you know, my Twitter just like lit up and I got told I was such an idiot. Um, one of, one of the, the, uh, one of my favorite lines was somebody, my tagline is, all I bring to the, to the party is 25 years of mistakes. And someone said, I guess he's just going to have another year of mistakes. And I told myself, I, I, you know, it's a pretty funny line, actually. I thought it was kind of funny. But in hindsight, it was just that the, the sentiment was so bad at that point 
that you kind of do that it, that it, it wouldn't take much for this thing to turn. And I remember getting bullish then. And I almost feel like we were back then when I, last week when I called that, it was almost in reverse. We had kind of uh, these, these Robin Hood traders taking stocks up like there's nobody's business. We had Dave Portnoy, uh, the, uh, the kind of the, the millennials new kind of, uh, let's just say, spokesman talk, making fun of Warren Buffett. We had all sorts of crazy, wacky stuff going on. And then finally you had Jerome Powell with the most dovish thing around. And I just felt like from a trading point of view, it was almost that in reverse. And I, I still, I'm kind of up in the, uh, I'm up on the fence now. I, I did kind of continue to sell it. And now we've had a couple of days of back higher. I do trade it around, but it kind of got into my head. I don't think it's quite over yet, the, the correction. I think that we still go a little lower, but this is where I'll, this is, this is, this is where I'm much different than most people. I do not think we are going to get kind of a return to the lows. And I, and I am not talking about kind of a correction of like back down 20, 30%. I would just purely plain for, I think I wrote a 10%, 10 to 15% correction. And I decided it was going to be quick. I still think it probably happened. We're not quite out of there yet, but uh, we'll see. Excellent, Kevin. Um, as a as as you are able to produce these thoughts uh, over over very uh, again esoteric ideas, um, maybe you could give us a couple resources that that you read um, on where you get this type of information. Well, one of the things is I always just kind of look for new ideas and I try to understand everything. I was laughing with you before we were uh, chatting kind of before the interview and I said, my knowledge is an inch thick and a mile wide. And um, I, I just, I'm really curious. And like MMT was a perfect example. I, you know, I was just curious about it. So I went and I was like, what is this? And I thought I, I better learn about it. Even the TGA, I saw something about this treasury general account. And I said, well, how does that work? And I just go and I, and I kind of dig my, you know, dig into it. And I, and I just try to understand how it all works in the economy. And I do find that these things start to make sense. And it's a little bit easier for me to kind of make trading calls when I understand all the different factors at play. And uh, like here's another example, quantitative easing. I remember when it first came out in the, you know, in the aftermath of the great financial crisis. And I remember uh, there were some days that all of a sudden the market got strangely bid at 1130. And like, I would be sitting there trading and I would look at it and I go, uh, it would look like I'd be piling on and expecting it to crack. And then all of a sudden it'd get a bid and it would take off for the rest of the day. And I couldn't figure it out. Like it took me a couple months of watching this and just keep selling into this and then it would be wrong. I couldn't figure it out. And then somehow I stumbled upon kind of the, the schedule where the Fed was buying you know, their bonds. And it clicked. It said, oh my God, there it is. And the Fed's buying bonds. And those are the days the stock market's going up. Now, many people will tell me that this isn't, shouldn't be the case. They'll tell me, like, they'll say, oh, no, that doesn't make any sense. There's no reason, blah, 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 blah. I don't care. It, it works. And, and, it, and it happened. And I remember I tracked it, and I would look at the, the percentage return. And I, and I definitely think the Fed affects markets. And I don't think it's – like, I don't think it's as nefarious as some people believe. I just think it's the way of the world. And I'll give you an example. I, I came upon uh, a trader that I got to know, and he told me that he worked for a, a, a kind of a asset allocator. And one of their clients was the uh, Japanese Postal Service. And so the Japanese Postal Service, is, it's kind of a strange name, and I, I might not be doing it right, but it's actually the world's largest pension plan. I, like it's literally the largest pension plan in the world. And um, he told me that what they would do is they would watch for – the Japanese government quantitative easing days, because what would happen is the Bank of Japan would buy JGBs, the postal, the pension plan would sell it, and then these guys would get an order. And so I just think that there's things like that in the world that occur that maybe it doesn't make sense and it shouldn't be that way, but it, that's just how it works. And so I'm always just 
watching for those kind of relationships and, and just uh, trying to stay curious about all the different parts of how the economy and the markets work. Absolutely, Kevin. Well, um, there's many topics we could cover. There's lots about uh, J- the Japanese stock market and the uh, the government pension investment fund, when the largest pension plan in the world that we could get into. So let us know if you enjoyed our interview with the macro tourist, Kevin Muir, and uh, let us know what you think. So if anyone wants to have a, a kind of a look at my letter, Please just send me an email. I'll fire you off some examples. It's Kevin at the macrotourist.com. Thanks a lot for your time, Tom. It's been a great uh, pleasure being with you. Thanks for being with us, Kevin. And as always, we'll provide all the, the links for Kevin's website in the show notes. Thanks for your time today, Kevin. Take care. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?